Well, now that we have a thrombus, what can happen to them? Uh, there's only three or four things that could possibly happen to thrombi. One thing is that they can get bigger. And when they do, they usually propagate or grow downstream. In other words, with the flow. They propagate in the same direction that they embolize. So if they are arterial, they grow and fragment away from the heart. If they are venous, it's the other direction. They can become uh, eventually resolved or dissolution by the body's normal uh, mechanism of fibrinolysis with time. They can organize after they adhere to the wall, just like any inflammatory process can organize by uh, ultimately in growth of blood vessels, uh, followed by fibrosis, or they can recanalize. Uh, whether the thrombus uh, obstructs or not, but usually the ones that obstruct will uh, recanalize by virtue of the fact that flow can then uh, go through them to make up for the flow that was blocked by uh, virtue of them obstructing the uh, blood vessel. So here it is in a graphic form. Here's your clot. It could resolve. It could embolize. Of course, we're talking about venous clots now, aren't we? It could organize, which means incorporate into the wall and go through the changes that all tissues will go through. Or it could recanalize in that uh, flow can go through the clot and still be going through this blood vessel, even though it had been largely, if not entirely, obstructed by the blood clot. Is this an example of an occlusive arterial thrombus? Of course it is, because you can see there are pretty thick layers of smooth muscle here, so you know it was an art artery or arterial. And another way to prove this is an arterial thrombus is to do an elastic tissue stain, because veins do not have significant uh, elastic lamina. And up here, you could see a pretty good one, perhaps disrupted from the clot, but certainly there. So. In that case, we're talking about an occlusive arterial thrombus. Uh, but let's talk about the more common type of thrombus, and that's venous thrombus, venous thrombosis. In addition, let's call them deep venous thromboses, or DVT, because we all know that superficial veins anywhere in the body can be extens extensively thrombotic but they are not regarded as giving rise to pulmonary emboli. It's only the deep veins of the calf, the thigh, and the pelvis that actually embolize. Uh, I'm sure there may be some examples, uh, exceptions to this, but uh, don't worry if your patient uh, has a superficial thrombus that's going to embolize uh, to the lungs, because it won't. Uh, if there is decreased flow in general, remember stasis. A congestive heart failure, perhaps causing that decreased flow, is a huge factor. But the single biggest factor uh, for DVT is inactivity. And the classical prototype of a DVT and a pulmonary embolism patient is somebody that's been sick from anything, and they've been lying around in a bed for a long time. That's the number one risk factor. Trauma, of course, sets in because trauma can uh, disrupt endothelium, and cause clots, extensive surgery. Uh, there is a always a significant concern that a day or two after surgery, pro sometimes even a little bit less, you may flip an embolism to your lungs. Tissue trauma through burns are also a risk factor. And of course, theoretically, any injury to a vessel which uh, injures or disrupts that endothelial cell can change it from a, a Dr. Jekyll into a Mr. Hyde. Of course, if there are procroagulant substances from uh, tissues intrinsically, which they are, that's a factor, and they fit into some of these other things we talked about. And if you have a reduction in your mechanism, which normally dissolves blood clots, that would be the same as uh, helping to induce a blood clot. So it's a double negative. So reduced tissue plasminogen activator activity 
is also a risk factor for uh, DVT. Uh, let's talk about arterial uh, and or cardiac thrombi, mural thrombi. Um, an acute myocardial infarction is not just atherosclerosis. All of the acute uh, cardiac syndromes are atherosclerosis plus fresh thrombosis. And remember, if you have an arterial thrombus, be it a coronary artery or mural or uh, um, aortic, these will send fragments downstream. And because the clots may be intimately mixed in with atherosclerotic plaque and calcium, if you see a cholesterol cleft, for example, inside of a blood clot, that's probably an arterial thrombus rather than a venous one, isn't it? And if you want to know what are the chances of the brain or the kidneys or the liver or the legs receiving a mural thrombus or a large um, uh, aortic thrombus, look at what percentage that that organ normally gets of cardiac output and that will be the chances that it will large th lodge there. Another thing is to look at the diameter of the vessel. The diameter is larger, chances are it has more cardiac output, chances are it's more likely to receive the arterial thrombus. Let's look at an atheroembolism microscopically and if you could recognize this as being uh, a plugged up blood vessel and you can see a cholesterol cleft and uh, it's in some place like let's say a kidney or a brain you know that this came from an artery and not a vein because venous thrombi don't have atherosclerotic plaques long story short cholesterol clefts in a blood clot mean arterial thrombi or atheroemboli uh, more correctly phrased uh, I guess it's time to open the door for one of the most common types of uh, coagulation seen in a huge variety of serious uh, illnesses called DIC. The single biggest category for DIC is obstetrical complications. But patients with advanced malignancy or extreme trauma uh, are also candidates for DIC. It's as common in serious illness as shock is in itself. In fact, shock is both a cause and an effect of DIC. DIC by itself is not a uh, primary disease. It is a coagulopathy called a consumptive coagulopathy. Why? Because in the process of forming small blood clots and many small vessels throughout the entire body, including the vessels of very important organs like brain and kidneys, it consumes blood clotting factors. And there are blood clotting factors like platelets, fibrinogen, factor VIII, which are called consumable, which means they will be reduced if there's significant coagulation going on. And therefore, these levels will be very, very low in the blood uh, serum of uh, patients with DIC. And that itself uh, could be a uh, cause for multiple transfusions. I have a very, very smart OB doc who told me that he has never given so many transfusions uh, as patients that have DIC. And you just keep pouring it in them. And that's uh, Dr. Steinman. Uh, and of course, you would see the effects of DIC, even though it goes on diffusely everywhere in the organs which are the most critical, like brain, heart, lungs, kidneys. Uh, and these are only microscopic thrombi, aren't they? Because they're in the very, very small vessels. You could not see DIC with your naked eye usually, like you'd see a big blood clot in a pulmonary uh, artery. Uh, let's take a look at a kidney. And if it looks to you like uh, these glomerular capillaries are redder than normal, it's not because they're congested with blood, it's because that's fibrin. That's DIC involving the glomerular capillaries. But remember, this can happen everywhere. Here's a little bit in a blood vessel here. Here's a bigger chunk in one of the glomeruli. And here's a whole bunch of little uh, glomerular capillaries being blocked over there. Uh, 
that's a, a nice summary of DIC. We could end here and start out with uh, PowerPoint slide number 79 in the next 10-minute clip, and I thank you very much.